Next up, we have Indu Roy Chowdhury. Indu is joining us from the University of California, Davis. Indu worked with Kevin Sampson and Tim Schneider this summer in CGD in our Climate and Global Dynamics Lab. And her topic for or her title of her oral presentation today is Wetland Restoration and Flood Protection, Strengthening Echo, sorry, Econometric Models Using, using Observed and Modeled Land Cover and Hydrologic, hydrologic Data. I stuck the landing right. Great. <laughs> um, the title of my presentation is uh, Wetland Restoration and Flood Protection Strengthening Econometric Models Using Observational and Modeled Hydrologic Data. Uh, and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. Um, so starting off with a little bit of background on wetlands. Um, so a wetland is a, ter um, a transitional ecosystem between terrestrial and aquatic um, ecosystems, and it's characterized by uh, largely saturated soil conditions in which um, the vegetation la it largely grows in water or in saturated soils. Um, it, they're important because they provide a whole wealth of ecosystem services, which are the benefits that accrue to people from the natural environment. Um, they provide, well, this diagram shows, but they provide wildlife habitat, um, groundwater recharge, uh, water filtration, and the one that I'm going to be focusing on in my work um, is flood protection. So how do wetlands affect flooding? So wetlands have a very unique capacity to act as a sponge by uh, collecting water during flood events and releasing it slowly during dry events. Um, secondarily, they also, um, their vegetation and root mats also slow down um, floodwaters and reduce peak flows downstream. So there's a lot of different um, ways in which wetlands can reduce flooding, but it's all dependent on all of these different factors, including where they're located in relation to a community. Um, so for example, a wetland downstream is not going to mitigate flooding to a community upstream. So it's important that um, these upstream downstream dynamics are um, incorporated. And there's a lot of prior literature that shows that uh, coastal wetlands are uh, frontline defense for storm surge. And then there's less literature that shows that uh, inland wetlands uh, um, affect fluvial, fluvial and fluvial flooding. But there is, it does exist. Uh, but that's somewhat of a gap in the literature and what I'm trying to fill here. So my first research question is, are the flood protection benefits of mitigation banks, which are a type of restored wetlands, uh, the same as natural wetlands? Uh, and I'll explain more about mitigation banks shortly. But uh, secondarily, uh, I wanted to look at how remotely sensed land cover data, observational um, data from stream gauges, and modeled hydrological data can strengthen my models of causal inference between that of the relationships between wetlands and flooding, flood damages specifically. So what is a mitigation bank? This is a, bit, a little bit of a complicated concept, and most people have not heard of them. But um, they're a type of environmental market. Uh, Section 404 of the Clean Water Act uh, pur purports this goal to keep the same amount of wetlands in the U.S. So the goal is, it's referred to informally as no net loss. So basically, if a wetland is uh, degraded in one part of a watershed, it needs to be equivalently restored in that same watershed. So mitigation banks emerged sort of in response to this uh, policy. So instead of a developer degrading um, a water a wetland in one part of a watershed and then doing the restoration themselves, they purchase credits from this bank. That's a larger uh, restored, um, previously restored swath of land that uh, provides a larger sort of more consolidated um, source of habitat. Um, and so they purchase these credits that are equivalent to whatever the ecological value is of whatever wetland they've degraded. And this is a somewhat qualitative um, process. So this is an example of a mitigation bank. On the left, we have the footprint, which is the actual bank itself. And on the right is the service area, which is like the general watershed in which a wetland can be degraded and credits purchased from this bank. This is a distribution of all the um, US Army Corps of Engineer mitigation banks in the US. Um, as you can see, they're mostly concentrated in areas that have more wetlands. Um, they are, um, I think there's like 2,800 or so. Official ones, yeah. So my work, I look at the um, relationship between flood damages and uh, change in wetland area. So uh, the outcome variable I'm using here is National Flood Insurance Program claims. And the reason I'm using this is because uh, it is a pretty direct measure of flood damages, and it's the main mechanism uh, for flood insurance in the US. 
it's basically there's no there's very minimal private insurance for flood insurance um, and it also is available geographically because it's largely mandated in a lot of these special flood hazard zones and it's the data is available temporally as well so this is a, a little bit arcane i know to, to most maybe but i i will go over it uh shortly so I spent the first half of this summer uh, rescaling this analysis from the zip code level to the HUC12 level, and that involved uh, a bit of um, a lot of my variables were at the administrative boundary level, like zip code or census tract, and then the HUC12 obviously is a hydrological watershed level, and so it involved a lot of um, weighted reaggregations, and um, I will go over that. <laughs> so my first model here is what we call a long difference model. And this is essentially a regression that looks at the relationship between flood damages, the NFIP claims, and the change in wetland area over a 20 year time period. So I'm looking at the differences in each of these variables between 2021 and 2001. So it's simple as that. Um, the change in wetland area I got from the uh, land cover mapping, I always forget what the acronym stands for, the, it's the, the product is LC map and it's from the National Land Cover Database of USGS. Uh, I always forget what it stands for, but um, I will look it up if anyone needs to know. <laughs> um, but uh, it's basically like a yearly product of land cover. Um, so that's where that data comes from. And then the restored wetland area comes from the um, boundaries of the mitigation banks. And theta is a suite of covariates that includes uh, housing units, housing values, population, um, and community rating system discount. Uh, alpha is a fixed effects term, which basically just controls for all time invariant differences between um, the uh, HUC, HUC 8s. So the, uh, so the second model is a panel model, and instead of looking at the, this long environmental change over 20 years, I'm looking at panels of five years. So it's the same data, but um, there's snapshots of 2001, 20, 2006, 2011, 2016, and 2021. Um, everything else is the same, except that there's also a term that uh, is referred to as year fixed effects, which controls for time varying differences between um, HUC 8s. Okay, so my results. Um, at the zip code level, uh, chain, an increase in wetland area is associated with a decrease in flood claims, um, and this interaction term is, all, is positive. Um, this, okay, I don't want to mess with the pointer, but... Um, the, the box at the bottom there is the interaction term, the coefficient on the interaction term, and that's positive and statistically significant, uh, which indicates that uh, restored wetlands are less effective than natural wetlands at reducing flood damages. So when I did this reaggregation to the HUC-12 watershed level, I lost basically any effect and all the significance, but um, I, I'm hypothesizing that that is because a lot of, this is a within analysis, so I'm looking at um, variation within watersheds, and a lot of these effects are spillover effects because the benefits are accruing to communities downstream. So that's, you know, that's uh, my future direction with this. Um, and then for the panel model, interestingly, we didn't see an effect at the zip code level, but we saw that restored wetlands decreased flood damages um, and still less effectively than natural wetlands. But th these should be taken with a grain of salt, I think, because of the, because of the spillover effects that are not being accounted for. Okay, so since my models are very uh, social science-y, very demo like demographic variable heavy, I wanted to incorporate, I wanted to spend the summer incorporating more um, hydrologic variables. And so I chose a case study, um, and I, the case study that I chose was the Sacramento River, ba River Basin because it has a relatively high concentration of both NFIP claims and policies and um, also wet inland wetland areas because I wanted to focus my study on fluvial and fluvial flooding rather than coastal storm surge. So on the left is the uh, change in wetland area. This is also from LC map from uh, the National Land Cover Database um, by HUC-12 watershed, uh, which is a small, sm pretty small unit of uh, watershed. Um, and on the right is the aggregation of the wetland area upstream of all the HUC-12s upstream of a given census tract. So since we're trying to look at these upstream downstream dynamics, I figured that would be a useful um, visual. Okay, so I looked, I worked with both model data and observational data over this study. Um, and so for the 
observational data, uh, the benefits are that it's, you know, it's real data, it's ground truth. Um, it, the disadvantages are that it's uh, not as spatially and temporally uh, available as the model data. But for that reason, I just looked at both and I saw if there was any um, relationship or correlation. Uh, and so to the top right of the slide is a map that is, um, shows the wetland change by the basin that contributes to um, each uh, river gauge and then this graph shows the max stream flow in the Sacramento River Basin, uh, the max daily stream flow uh, for every day from 1998 to 2021, and then the associated uh, NFIP claims on that day. The number of claims, not the amount. So yeah, as you can see, it's like there is a pretty decent correlation there, and then um, on the days that there aren't, there, it's likely because you know the, the stream flow event happens and then um, the claim gets filed maybe a few days later. So there, there is potentially a lag there. Uh, this is the model data, which comes from the national water model. And uh, the difference, the disadvantage to this model, even though um, it, we have data for every flow line and basically every point in time, is that it's fixed at this 2016 land cover, which is not the most helpful for my analysis because I'm looking at land cover change as my variable of interest. So this, um, Graph shows this basically the same thing, um, max daily stream flow and associated NFIP claims on that day. So yeah, the takeaways here are that I found um, that there was an increase um, that increased wetlands reduced flood damages in at the zip code level in um, zip codes that have mitigation banks. Um, at this level, the mitigation banks are less effective than natural wetlands at reducing flood damages. Um, and, that the, and the main takeaway, I think, of that analysis is that the flood protection will accrue to downstream communities, and so that's something that's going to need to be um, accounted for in future studies. Um, yeah, so that's my next goal, is uh, determining what banks are upstream or downstream of communities and what wetlands in general are. Um, and I also would like to play around a little more with uh, the hydrology of and um, physical elements here, um, including precipitation, elevation, and even just distance from communities. Um, I would like to thank Jerry and Ben and Tim, and especially Kevin, who sat with me for many, many hours every day on, on his busy schedule, who wasn't able to be here today. But um, yeah, these are my references. Thank you. Sorry if I spoke fast. No, thank you, Indu. That was wonderful. All right, do we have some questions for Indu for, uh, from the audience? Um, you know, I've heard about this concept concept of sponge cities. Is this a sort of analysis that will go into determining? I, I know in Europe, I don't know here, um, like the, the some of the advantages of having a sponge city, and I, how do you determine like really uh, highlighting the advantages downstream as you move on, just incorporating that into your model so it's. Yeah, maybe you can't see the flood advantages of having, you know, incorporating wetlands into cities, but you can show that lower down, downstream, um, fields are getting flooded or agricultural land is being benefited. Yeah, well, actually, there is there are some studies that show that, like, the distance from the city is very important. Like, if a, if a wetland is right next to a city, and it is slowing down floodwaters, it or if it's like adjacent maybe and not like intermediately upstream, um, there could be an effect where actually the vegetate the roughness of the vegetation makes like increases the flood stage because the water's not moving as quickly, and that can actually cause flooding. So it's it's very like delicate, I think, um, like whether or not a wetland can actually mitigate flooding. Um, it's not always, it's not that they always do if they're upstream. Um, there, there do have to be very specific conditions. And um, yeah, my work specifically with mitigation banks, they tend to not be located even near populated centers because it's like land purchased from private landowners who are, you know, selling whatever land is cheapest, basically. 
um, and those tend to not be near cities. So that is like another, that's another level to this, I think. And I, I do think it's really interesting to like, maybe look at where, where are these being built or like degraded? And, you know, it does, is that having an effect on flood damages? Right. But yeah, thank you. Good question. Thank you. Hello. How are we quantifying um, the deg degradation of the watershed to then, did you say rebuild it um, with the migration banks or mitigation banks? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, kind of, because um, I know that you said that uh, the mitigation banks will then take on um, the task of, re of yeah, rectifying, so, I yeah, guess. Yeah, so basically, like, if a wetland, it, depending on the watershed, like, if a wetland is degraded, then the mitigation bank is, like, already built, basically, and the developer purchases credits from this bank that's already existing in order to offset their impact. It's very, like, oh. it's, pro it's somewhat problematic for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Um, okay. But, yeah, what was your question, though? I think... That was it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of going back to your uh, problematic, um, and this may just be me, you know, being ignorant, not knowing the difference between the mitigation bank and, like, say, cap and trade. But with cap and trade, they they can sell the credits. Yeah. Um, after they've already purchased them for, mm -hmm. for uh, more revenue, essentially, is that something you see happening, or uh, have heard of that happening at all? Um. You mean like if they purchase credits and like resell them? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, that does. I don't think that really happens. Um, I think cap and trade is like slightly different because there's like a set cap, and so you have to like operate within that cap, and so that's why the trading happens. Mm -hmm. But this is more like there's, the mitigation banks are like a private industry, and they're like selling credits, like that's how basically how it works. But yeah, it's it's there's some like philosophical questions because it's like you know if a wetland is, if you're purchasing credits to degrade, then like necessarily that land is more valuable. Otherwise you wouldn't be buying, degrading that wetland. So, you know, there's not really a, a price for that. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll have one more. <laughs> Are there any online? I don't want to take them. Uh, they'll post them. Yeah, ni nice work into and and I should just say uh, embarrasser, but Kevin couldn't be here, but he worked a lot with Indu and spoke very highly of her work. So I just wanted to share that. But it, this might be a little bit of an unfair question in a way because it it's it's a little broader than your work here this summer. But and your your question about sponge cities was great, and it got me kind of thinking. It's like so, so it seems like the mitigation banks maybe help a little, but. Not a lot. Obviously, having the, the native wetlands when they're there is maybe the best. Yeah. Um, and being a tree hugger, I'd prefer to see that myself. But is there anything in your work that suggested other approaches that could be helpful? Um, other approaches for flood mitigation? Or? Yeah, even just general benefits of of you know, water quality, flood mitigation, just Oh, other ecosystem services? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I have, that's chapter three of my dissertation. I, yeah. <laughs> I am, uh, I, I'm looking at other, I'm looking at a suite of, like, biodiversity and um, water quality, et cetera, like, all of these soil quality indicators. And so I, I hope to, to do that. Um, it's really difficult to do that at, at the scale of CONUS, just because, it's, you know, you can't really go and ground truth everything. But, uh, but yeah, it's, that's, it's on my agenda for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Indu.